I'm not on the urn. Not a million miles from it, but I'm not on the urn. In fact, you've seen me fish this bay before. It's changed since the last time I was here, though. But anyway, I'm going to finish watching this sunrise. And I'm going to make a cup of coffee. So let's see what today brings, eh? That's it, two rods are, two rods are in. It's calm enough I might get the bit put out in a minute. I'm fishing a herring on one side. On this side there's like a tree line, we're in a bay here. And this side's open water. So I've chucked the nail head this direction and chucked the herring straight out in front of me. I'm going to run through I got lots of requests after the last video when I talked about ground bait. Well, I'm going to run through how I do the ground baiting. You know, some people ask what am I doing, how am I doing it. Well, it's a calm enough day for the bait boat, so I'll uh, I'll run through from start to finish what I do with the ground bait, from the opening the packet of ground bait to putting it in the water. It's amazing the things you guys want to watch, isn't it? Weather forecast gives it to be overcast and cloudy with some showers towards the late afternoon. But because of the, normally the wind is going that way, we're in a bay, so the trees are behind us. And that normally covers us a lot from the, uh, the wind. But we'll see how things are going. It's Northern Ireland. You just can't fucking predict the weather at times here. You know, one minute it could be sunshiny, the next minute it could be uh, ripping it down with rain. But since I've been here the last time, the, the powers that be have put in concrete fishing stands. Really nice job. They've put in places to actually park your car as well. Again, really nice job. But I'm going to finish my cup of, I'm going to have my cup of coffee and then I'll run through things for you, okay? Well, that was quick. I didn't even get time to finish my cup of coffee and it's spat the hooks out. I wonder where my it is. There you go. A little small jack pike. I wonder should we wait? <laughs> what a tiny little bugger. Ah, my eel's at the back of its throat. A little brute. And there he goes. It's not a monster, but it's not a blank. Now I'm going to put on a nice big smelt. I just need to untangle my hooks from my net. At least we're off the mark. There you go. What pike would look wouldn't take that? Right. Need to untangle this.
So, pike number one. Again, not a big one, but we're off the mark. So that means today's not a blank. All you people out there that say I don't catch fish. <laughs> now just to put my net back together. something weird happened. The drop arm kind of went up and then went down and then went up and went down so I think something's at the bait. So I'm gonna have a wee uh, feel here. Nothing. I don't know what happened there. Let's have a wee look, shall we? No, no bite marks that I can see. Hmm, strange. Might pop this up and then throw it back out again. So I'm gonna get a pop up. These are the cold hands. Well, let's see if this floats. Yeah, near the point. I don't think I'll bother floating it, I'll just put it back on the bottom. But I will give it a big injection of some smelt oil. Let's get this bad 
boy put out. And that's us on the bottom. Don't know what happened there. Not sure, a bit strange, but that's angling. I'm going to show you how to mix the ground bit up. In the bucket is just some ground bit. Red crumb and those krill little pellets, ground bit. You've seen me make this sort of stuff before. This is just fish heads, guts, oil, blood in a bag. So you take this out. Remember taking all your litter home with you. Leaving no litter behind you. Put that into the bag. Making sure you get all of it. Because it's all good stuff. Then I'm going to take some mackerel. Now, this mackerel has been smooshed up. The quickest way to smoosh up mackerel is to put it on the ground and step at it. And it smooshes it up, crushes it. So you're going to take your, your scissors again. And you're going to open it up. And you're going to pour it in the whole bag. Not leaving any mess. You're going to take all this rubbish home with you and throw it and dispose of it properly. This stuff stinks. Right. Because stepping on them's only kind of smashed them up, get your scissors in, get them chopped up. You're not wanting to feed the fish, you're just wanting to create a load of attraction. I'm going to fast forward this bit so you don't have to sit and watch me uh, chopping bit. You can add a bit of oil to it, just to give it that extra kick. So that's what we're going to do now. You don't have to go too mad. Oil goes a little bit of oil goes a long way. There you have it. That's the ground bit I would use for pike fishing. As you can see, there's some lovely chunks of fish in there. There's some nice crumb in there. There's lots of oil in there. Now I'm going to let this sit for a little while because the fish is still kind of half frozen. And as it thaws out, it's going to release more of its juices. So after about 20 minutes, this will be ready because all the stuff's going to come out of the fish and make the, uh, the crumb so you can put it into a ball. So I'll get see you in 20 minutes. Before we get back to the ground baiting, I'm gonna bring up a little point. I live in County Tyrone, Northern Ireland. County Tyrone, on the border, with, on the border of County Tyrone, there's a place called Donegal, County Donegal. That's in the Republic of Ireland. 
Uh, the border between from or Tyrone, Fermanagh, Donegal, Monaghan, Cavan. There's lots of uh, big hills, lots of natural bog. Now, for those of you that don't know what a bog is, a bog is basically uh, unsure ground. Ground that over the years has been, um, there's lots of sediment in it and it's not very, uh, and it's, you can't build on it. You know, a, a bog, if you fall into a bog today and die, thousands of years from the, f the future, they can dig you up and you'll still be preserved because the bog, bogs do that. Bogs, you know, there's a phenomenon called bog bodies where they're, you know, digging up woolly mammoths, that, you know, drowned in bogs and they're still, you know, pretty intact. They even so much as to go that they have like uh, remains of food in their gut. So that tells you how, you know, a bog, I think it's because of the, 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 there's no oxygen, there's no bacteria, so you're, nothing can like, dissolve you, you know, that you basically go into a, like a state where you're froze without the ice. There's a part of the, part of the Sir Owen Donegal border that's right next to a place called Castle Derg. The Castle Derg's where I grew up and got taught how to fish on the River Derg. The River Derg has a tributary uh, that's called the Morn Beg. There's a river that flows, it's called the River Morn Beg, it flows into the River Derg and you know it's just one of the tributaries. Well beside the Morn Beg there's a big big stretch of uh, bogland that the powers that be in the Republic of Ireland decided it was a good idea to allow Google Yes, Google, the, uh, the multi-billion pound industry, to build windmills on it. My personal view on the windmills are is they're a bloody eyesore. They're not effective, they don't produce a lot of energy. And they just destroy the natural wildlife, destroy the natural uh, habitats, destroy migratory birds. They're an eyesore and a blot in the nature, but I can understand we need uh, green energy. And the search for it has to go on. You know, eventually we'll run out of coal and oil and stuff like that. But I don't think windmills are the answer. But anyway, the locals around this particular stretch of bog all said, "Do not build on this land. This land is not suitable to build anything on." That's local people that live in Donegal. The powers that be in Dublin, in some cushy office, decided to rubber stamp it and give it the go ahead. Not saying that the politician that, that did it probably got a nice new house or a big fancy car as a wee bit of a wee bit of gift of to uh, gifting to grease the wheels, so to speak. That would be hinting that maybe there was some corruption, and we've all know that politicians and governments wouldn't be corrupt. No, not at all. Anyway, the disaster that was predicted uh, three or four years ago has eventually happened. Because the turbines are constantly putting vibration into the ground and they've moved hundreds of tons of rock to build roads to get to these things, they've caused what's called a landslip, landslide, where the, the bog is basically liquefied and it's flown into the River Mornbeg, which has flown into the River Derg. River Derg is one of the finest salmon fisheries in the world. I learned to fish there. It's very close to my heart. So to see environmental accidents that, you know, could have been prevented, you know, shouldn't have even happened, it's a bit of a kick in the guts. So I'm going to show you a little clip now of a video showing the bog actually flowing down a hill. Uh, there you go.
So there we have it. The bog basically liquefied. Hundreds and hundreds of tons of uh, bog material flowed into a river. It's, it's basically like uh, turning a river from water into soup, if you can imagine it. And the Bourne Beg basically flooded into the Derg. The only saving grace, and this is the only saving grace, at the minute, the River Derg's got high water because we're in the winter time we've had some floods. That's the only saving grace that the high water might disperse the, the, the pollution and wash it out of the system really quickly. The nightmare scenario is spawning beds, parts of the river that have got like uh, nice gravelly beds where the salmon lay their eggs, get silted over and you lose a generation of salmon. If the spawning beds become silted up, the salmon don't spawn. Massive problems. So, we have a case of greed, government corruption or incompetence, and an environmental disaster. Isn't life grand? Now, as always, there isn't much that we can do because it's already happened. The locks agency that deal with the... Excuse me, there are poor my milk in my cup of coffee. The locks agency basically look after the rivers and they have been on the case like a tramp on hot chips. The equivalent agency in the Republic of Ireland has been on the case as well. But just because people are walking the rivers and looking at the, the corruption of the pollution and the mess and the dirt, I don't know how that fixes the problem. And here's something that'll uh, blow the balls clean off of you. There's another tranche of windmill designs less than 1500 yards as the crow flies that's been approved by the Irish government. This got approved shortly after the, uh, the landslide. Couldn't make it up, could you? If you wrote this down and put it into like a movie script, people would say, there's no fucking way that sort of stuff happens. And these are our political masters. These are the educated, the learner types that are looking out for our interests. So, I'm not sure if, it's, if this could class as a rant. I don't think it's a rant. I know I'm pissed off. I know I feel quite angry about it. There isn't a whole lot I can do about it though. Not a whole lot at all. And here we have a weird end share. Awesome. You'll be asking, how am I using the not waterproof GoPro in the rain? Well, I has me now a umbrella for the GoPro. I just wish that they hadn't concreted this so that I could have put an umbrella for the human on it. <laughs> oh God. I'm going to drink my coffee, then I'll do the, the, the rest of the ground bit feature thing. Right, what I'm going to do now is put the, the bait into a bait boat and I'm going to fire up this bad boy that down there. and I'm going to put the the bait, the ground bait, into the hoppers here.
Right. So that's the ground bit, the pike ground bit, in the bait boat. Now I'm going to set my hook bait on top of it, so that when it falls, it's not going to get caught up on any of the, the loose feed that I'm feeding. So let's get this, let's get the controller first. Let's get this in the water. And away she goes. Hi there. Doing okay. I think I'm only going to get one run with this because the battery and the remote's going to die on me. Pardon? It's a remote control boat. It's a remote control bait boat. You fill it up with the bait for the fish and then you zip it out and then the you press this lever here, it drops everything. So you you kind of put it out, and because I'm putting up lots of chopped fish and stuff like that to attract the fish, if you're trying to cast it, you'd, you'd never get it done. So, so this here is fit to. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, not a problem. <laughs> Unfortunately, today's episode of cooking with scobes isn't exactly cooking. It's reheating. The garage on the way here didn't have any bacon or bread, but it had these things. So we're going to have them instead. The rain looks to have kind of set in a wee bit. I have the umbrella up for the GoPro here. One small thing I forgot when you're fishing with ground bait for pike. These things, these are swim feeders that guys use for barbel fishing. This weighs three ounce, but you get them up to like five and six ounce. These here will hold your ground bait for your pike just as well as the bait boat does. You just have to bung it in. Now obviously if you're going to use chopped fish, you're going to have to chop it up a little bit more to make sure that when you cast this out it kind of stinks out and leaks out into the water. If you're bunging up, you know, fish in a like whole fish in it, it's just going to block it up. With this here it is important that you use a ledger link because if the pike picks up this instead of your bait you don't want it uh, biting you off. You basically want this filled up with like crumb and little tiny particles of fish so it hits the bottom this all comes out. What a day. I can see it's going to burn out because it's clear sky is coming in this direction, so it's going to wash itself out now, even it. But the oil slick from the ground bait patch is absolutely huge. <laughs> if there's pike out there and they don't smell that, then something, my friends, is very wrong. Because that, that's going to smell like curry to a piss head. Temperature wise, we're sitting at five degrees today, so it's a little bit chilly. Because I'm fishing in the Republic of Ireland, you're allowed two rods. And because I'm fishing, the only place in the Republic of Ireland that I've ever actually been reminded of that by, an, by a fisheries official, I'm only using two rods. There's three rods on the pod because I had to take three rods out of the rod bag. 
So I have one kind of rigged up ready to rock and roll if I have to uh, break down one for whatever reason. But it's quite nice to be out. I'm enjoying the day. I think my uh, heated sandwich is ready. You can hear the rain hitting off the uh, the tippy monkey, I mean ridge monkey. This is one of the original ones, the small ones. The ones with the handles are bolted on, not kind of, you know, held on by a wing and a prayer. At least it isn't a blank. Well, that was a disappointing breakfast. I think it's just gone 11 o'clock. Let me just check. It's actually just gone half one. <laughs> How time flies when you're having fun, eh? This is third cup of coffee of the day. That spot where I dumped all the ground bit, it's still, <laughs> still quite a healthy slick coming off of it. Because you use the ground bit and it's mostly breadcrumbs, it sucks up all like the fish blood and the fish oil and the natural stuff, the natural fluid that comes from your bait. So it just absorbs all of that stuff. This is why when you're using the, like a ground bait and you're chopping up fish to put in it, you know, time's your friend. Let it sit for half an hour. Even better, if you can get away with doing it, do it the night before. Let it sit. That way that, you know, you want to mix it so it's kind of dry. You'll notice I didn't put any water into that ground bait at all. You know, I was just using the oil that came out of the fish and a little bit of extra oil that was mixed in with it. You know, I could have used some sea seamer salmon extract or tuna extract, but I didn't really use any of that either. I just used like a little bit of oil and the natural juice that had come out of the fish. And by letting it sit that 20 minutes, the, the crumb went from like dry and powdery to sticky. So the fish had been, you know, as they defrost, they'll, they'll leak into it and you get quite a healthy oil slick of food for them. Now there's some debate whether pike can smell oils or not. Uh, some people will say that pike's skulls and the way their, na their nose is set up, you know, they don't smell fish the same way carp would or roach or perch would. I don't know, for me the jury's out. I think if you take a dead bit and you cast it out and then you cast out at the same sort of species like two mackerel, if you cast out one mackerel and then you cast out another mackerel, but you've slashed the sides of it. For me, the fish that's been slashed and opened up tends to be always the one that the pike pick up. So the, there must be something that the pike can smell and it, it must be some sort of pheromone or some sort of uh, scent, you know, the fish that's picking up. And yes, the, the, the dead bit that's, that's whole catches fish, but I think it's more like a, a quick attract method when you get it, like even like a roach and punch a few holes in it, you know, into the gut cavity and let the juice come out of it. Same with when I'm casting like a bigger bit. You know, I think nothing of putting the knife through its head and opening or twisting the knife a bit just to get the bloods and the fluids out of the skull of the bit. The skull holds so much blood, you know, the skull's where most of the blood goes in a, in a fish. So it's getting all that flavour into the water column. And because you're putting it, you know, out by a bait boat, it's not going to go down in one lump. We're fishing, you know, at relatively deep water here. So it's going to kind of go out and spread out over a bit of a distance. So you're going to have bits of chopped fish lying in the ground that smell. You're then going to have bits of breadcrumb. And it's going to be rising up the water columns and falling down the water columns. I put little bits of little krill pellets in there. They're going to be they're going to be breaking down and kicking off smells as well. And the idea that I do when I'm ground baiting is putting a lot of flavour into one area. Like that area, I know how far that is out. 
I have a little elastic knot, you know, marker elastic tied to my line. So if I was going to put a bit out on that spot again, you just have to take line until you, you know, you, I'm going in the same direction. I'm, I know where I'm about, so I'm going on the far bank. I've picked a marker on the far bank. So as soon as you see that little bit of marker elastic coming off your rail, you know that you're at the distance. I mean, okay, it's not going to be as scientific as, you know, measuring it with measuring sticks. But it gets you in the game zone. So far, that rod hasn't went off yet. But there's still four or five, there's still at least four hours of daylight left, so... Let's uh, keep those fingers crossed and stay positive, eh? The long range rod has went off. Could it be the wind? I think I found something there. Yep, we're in. Doesn't feel very big, but... It's a fish. Come on here, you bugger. Pike number two of the day. Maybe, 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 maybe a double. That's the rod unclipped. Let's get the fish in the unhooking mud. Let's get this net out of here. Let's 
picked up the big trout. Right, I see you, I see you. This is a very energetic fish. So people are saying that you need to kind of, you need to get your legs across the fish and straddle it. You don't need to do that at all. You don't need to do that at all. There we go, that's tagged me. Not a very, just a nice little jack. Healthy. Let's take a wee photograph of it. Very light coloured. All right. Let's get it released back, shall we? There she goes. A few moments later. The whole lock to swim to. And that's where it wants to huff. Well, that's a, a first. I've just had the, the place come down to where I was fishing and they've they've asked me to at, provide where I live and all that sort of stuff that sort of identification and apparently there could be spot finds for people that are Travelling across the border and all of that good stuff. But they said to me that they'll let me uh, off. To be fair, they were nice enough guys, they're alright. Like they, they weren't. You know how you would get some policemen that can be uh, many Hitlers? These guys weren't like that at all. They were alright. So I'm going to take a slow drive, it's just gone 4 o'clock I'm going to take a slow drive back and get some bait because apparently the shops are going to be shut next week and because there's going to be another lockdown next week so I go now and get bait while the getting is good Ended up with two fish today. It wasn't that bad, two small jacks. Nothing to write home about. It's good just to get out. I hope you guys enjoyed the discussion about how I would use ground baiting. If you have any if you have any questions, 
about it, please give me a shout in the comments below. And if uh, microcut angling techniques or uh, any of the bait boat companies happen to watch this and they want to reach out to me and help des and design a, a bait boat that does for pike, then I'm happy to work with you. Batteries that run a full charge when I left the house drained after three runs with the bit boat. Now that could be just because it's the cold weather. It could be that the batteries are crap even though they're, they're relatively new. You know they're relatively they're only about eight, only about two years old. They've been well, I guess the summertime they were kept, you know dry and looked after. Fucking fox run across the road. It was nearly history. But I don't suppose that I think bait boat designers, when they design bait boats, they don't design them for pike anglers or have pike anglers in mind. I think it's mostly uh, carp anglers who fish with nice little boilies and stuff like that. Whereas pike anglers tend to fish places that are a little bit more wild, that need a little bit uh, stronger, more powerful bait boats. Just in case anyone's watching there and they think, I know who built, I know who builds bait boats. I best put them in touch with scopes. <laughs> Just want to say as well that thank you for all the recent subscribers. I seem to have had like a little bit of a jump, but I had like a, a jump of like 150 or 180 subscribers in the space of three weeks. So, I don't know what uh, what the YouTube algorithm's done, but welcome aboard, glad to have you, hope you're enjoying the content, feel free to share it, like it, subscribe, or like it, and leave comments, share it on your social media, all that sort of good stuff. One of the people that watched my channel actually reached out to me and said that he designed, has, he has a company that designs uh, big vinyl posters and he's done me some some custom channel vinyl posters you know things they got there blow me absolutely away I'm thinking you know people are going to watch this stuff and think people are going to watch the channel and think oh okay somebody's fishing I never in a million years think thought people would watch the channel and go I must get in touch with him and uh, say something complimentary and uh, be be, be kind of like generally nice to the guy I've, I never expected that at all I expected loads of uh, you know you shave yourself you fat hairy bastard but I never expect I, I kind of don't really know what to say when people kind of say nice things to me I guess that's kind of you know, I don't usually get them outside of like my family and my wife and that. I don't usually get people saying, you know, you know, nice complimentary things to me. But it's nice. It's weird. It kind of always knocks me for knocks me for a bit of a loop because I'm there thinking, you know, um, how do you reply back without sounding like a total asshole? You know, I, tr I do try and. I uh, reply to every comment that I get. You know, I do try to actually let people know that I've read your comments and you know thanks for leaving a comment. But you know you kind of feel like you're like saying the same thing like cheers for your comment, thanks a lot for your support. You, know, you kind of 
I don't want to feel like I don't want people to read them and think this fat bastard has just copied and pasted a load of cheers from the comment replies. Uh, YouTube has given me some uh, interesting things to think about. Also had a debate with people about the cradle. Some people actually don't like the cradle for unhooking the pike. You know, I don't understand that sort of debate myself. I used to have, a, I still actually have the unhooking mat I used to use. You know, it's perfectly serviceable. You know, people were saying, you know, you have to straddle the bit, you have to straddle the pike to unhook it. Uh, I don't think that you have to do that. I'll be honest, since buying the unhooking cradle, I found it to be an absolute game changer for unhooking pike. Someone suggested that the pike might be able to flip themselves, you know, back out of the, of the cradle. Uh, I'm sure it's a possibility. I'm sure that it could happen. Um, you know, nothing's infallible. But it's generally not something I worry about. I'm more than happy to leave a pike in it and, you know, get rods or nets away from the hooking mat. Or leave it in it for a split second, you know, without thinking the pike's going to come to any undue harm. It's the second fish that I caught today. The you know, notice that I was kind of trying to unhook it, trying to get hold of it, and one hook was only at those only hooked the one hook of the scissors, but it had a fly and treble. Servite so went to grab it, it twisted, and the fly and treble went. You know, if you're not careful with stuff like that. The uh, flying treble is going to reach out and snatch you. And that's just no fun. I've had that happen before. That's never any fun. And the battle of uh, human flesh and older trebles, older trebles always win. But I'm back out again tomorrow. The wife's work at night, so it suits me to kind of, you know, jump in the van, go fishing, get away for the day, let her have a bit of a rest, as opposed to me sitting in the house, you know, making a lot of noise and talking nonsense. At least that way she gets to sleep. I'll tell you a little secret about Mrs. Scobie. Mrs. Scobie is very, very cranky if you take away her sleep. Only a very, very, very silly person would take away Mrs. Scobie's sleep. Because she would uh, go from sugar and spice and all things nice to when she was bad, she was horrid. Anyway, that's enough blithering on. Until the next time, troops. Tie lines.